Welcome to my channel, I'm Gary Wuryawan and today I want to share to you my travel photography tips using Micro Four Thirds. Let's go! Now before we continue with today's video, I just want to let you know that I will put the timestamps of every chapters in this video on the comment down below as well as in the description box. So if you want to jump to any chapters that you want, you can do so by clicking on the timestamps on those places and you'll go directly to the chapters that you want to watch. Also, I'm planning to release a full course about travel photography in the near future. I'm making it right now and I'm very excited about that. And today's video will feature a little bit of snippets from that course. And if you're interested about that course, please let me know in the comments down below. Anyway, let's continue with today's video. So a few years ago, I made a video about travel photography using Micro Four Thirds. And today's video will be an update to that video. I will also feature Micro Four Thirds in this video. However, if you have a different camera format such as APS-C, full frame, or if you're just using smart smartphone i hope that you can still follow along with this video i don't really think that the camera formats will matter in this video what will matter is the techniques and some tips that i will share to you anyway what is travel photography well in my opinion travel photography basically means documenting your travel using photography so basically photographing anything that happens during your travel in practical terms travel photography can be anything it can be landscape photography it can be street photography it can be food photography it can be wildlife photography it can be portrait it can be any kind of photography genre however there are several key factors that makes travel photography different from any other kind of photography first as i mentioned before travel photography covers a lot of different kinds of photography in this one space so that means that you have to have that flexible mentality you have to be the jack of all trades you have to be very versatile you have to be able to capture many different kinds of photography genres and because of that perfection is not the main goal there will be so many compromise because when we travel we have limited time we have limited space and we have limited resource so there will be compromises everywhere and you have to really be efficient and you have to really be effective with your photography because we're not traveling just for photography we're also traveling for the experience of travel itself the joy of traveling and because of the limitations that I mentioned before, you have to be very effective. You can only capture what resonates for you. Otherwise, you will capture everything and you will fill up your memory cards and you'll end up with so many pictures that are not that meaningful. So only capture the ones that are meaningful for you. By the way, if you are wondering why I'm able to share all of these points and also this video, it's because I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel to so many countries in the world such as New Zealand, such as Iceland, Norway, Japan, uh, United States, Canada, Australia, so many different countries and I'm very thankful for that. So now in this video, I hope that I can share what I learned and give it to you so that you can apply when you go to some other countries in the near future anyway now i want to share a little bit of tips about some basic techniques of travel photography first let's talk about composition i personally really think that composition is everything when it comes to travel photography you have to place your object very carefully in the picture use other elements in the frame uh, to make your object stand out and make your picture look interesting the last thing that you want to have when it comes to composition in travel photography is a picture that looks confusing cluttered bland and uninteresting you want to make everything as interesting as good as beautiful as possible from my experience basic composition techniques works the best when it comes to travel photography rule of thirds it works really good when it comes to travel photography no matter the kind of picture that you take whether it's a landscape picture a street photography picture a food picture a portrait rule of thirds always works best and also if you have multiple subjects in the frame rule of thirds can really help to make it less cluttered and make your picture look interesting and strong 
Other composition technique that I use is layering. Layering works really good, so you have to employ foreground, mid-ground, background, and use them to make that sense of 3D in your picture, to make your picture have that sense of depth and dimension, you know. It's very important, in my opinion, to employ layering. Also, again, this works for any kind of genre in travel photography. So landscape, obviously, it will work best with layering, with foreground, mid-ground, background. But also for food photography, for portrait, surprisingly, it also works. So uh, just try using these techniques when you uh, have the chance to use it. Also similar to layering, I also enjoy using natural framing. So I use whatever I have in the foreground to make a natural frame in your photograph to make it look interesting. So this is an alternative to the layering technique that I just mentioned. Now let's move on from composition to lighting. Lighting is another important aspect in travel photography because the contrast between shadow and light, the uh, lighting itself, will make a uh, picture looks more interesting and when done correctly, uh, the lighting can make the picture have a little bit of a drama and that's sometimes uh, what we really need. A story, a drama, a mood, something that can give the vibe of the picture. So when it comes to travel photography, the lighting aspect that I really want is natural lighting because it is abundantly available and you don't have to really worry about bringing your lights and whatnot and it's just more practical. We want the best natural lighting possible. And that means for landscape photography, the blue hour or golden hour. Uh, during the golden hour or blue hour, you can get that dramatic looking sky, that dramatic looking uh, colors in your photograph that will give that dramatic vibe, that uh, emotional feeling, that depth in your picture that you might be looking for. However, sometimes you can also experiment with blue sky. With blue sky, uh, in my experience when I travel to Iceland, uh, can give you that cheery, happy, joyful vibe uh, on your picture. So uh, just experiment a little bit and don't just be too focused with blue hour or golden hour. For food photography, for indoor photography, for portrait, sometimes you want a soft, big uh, artificial light like in a cafe or something like that. Or if it's possible, you can try to find a big window and uh, get that natural uh, sunlight diffused through the window kind of light, which is very soft and very flattering, very good on food photography and also very good for a uh, portrait in general. With that said, there are two things that we want to avoid, harsh shadow and flat look. So harsh shadow is very obvious when you have a light directly above you, uh, then you get the shadows under your eyes or something like that. That's what I mean with harsh shadow. And with the flat look is uh, something like a flat lighting. So uh, the light hits straight from the front and it looks very bland. There's no shadow, there's no drama. We want to avoid those two things. With that said, there are some things that you can do to avoid harsh shadow and flat light. Uh, to avoid harsh shadow, you can adjust the angle of the light source that's hitting your subject. So if it's a sun, for example, try to adjust the position of the framing so that the sun is not directly in front of the subject. Try to make it hit from the side or something like that. And if it's an indoor portrait, you can uh, use shades, you can use diffuser, you can use a uh, tablecloth or uh, try to find some place with big windows so that it's not that flat looking and uh, not that harsh looking. Other things that you can do to uh, avoid harsh shadow and flat look is uh, by underexposing or overexposing to compensate for the light and shadow in your object. You can also go to a different vantage point so that you can still get the elements in the pictures that you want, but you're now not dealing with the harsh shadow anymore. And also if everything fails, you can use what's called strobis photography, off-camera flash photography. I made a video about it a few years ago. You can check it on the card above. But basically, you're using an off-camera flash so that you have your own light source so that you don't have to depend on the sun or the indoor lighting or the lamp or whatever and you can just control your own source light. So now that I've already covered some basic techniques of travel photography, now I want to talk a little bit about camera settings. Which modes do I use for travel photography? 
So in my experience, I usually use three of all the modes in my camera mode dial. I use the manual mode, the shutter priority, and also the aperture priority. If I have a lot of time, if I have spare time, if I'm not rushing to go to the next location, usually I will use manual mode and just adjust everything from the ISO, the aperture, and the shutter speed. Usually this is true for landscape pictures, for portrait pictures during travel because I have a lot of time and I can just nail down every settings and I can just make sure that everything is right, nothing is overexposed, nothing is underexposed. If I'm doing street photography or wildlife photography or any fast moving kind of objects, then I will usually switch to shutter priority because I want to make sure that the shutter speed is high enough so that I don't get blur in my images, I don't get motion blur, I don't get any camera shakes, especially if I'm using longer telephoto lens. For street photography and wildlife, during good light, I will set my shutter priority 1 500th of a second at minimum so that I don't have to worry about blur. I will go even faster to 1 1000 or maybe 1 2000 if it's really bright, if it's sunny and I have a fast lens on me, f2.8 zoom lenses, something like that. If it's dark or if it's nighttime, then I don't have the luxury of cranking up my shutter speed. So I will usually just set it to 1 100th of a second and just rely on my in-body stabilizer on my camera or the stabilizer on the lens. If I'm shooting stationary objects such as food photography, cityscape sceneries, then I will usually switch to aperture priority mode. I will usually set my aperture priority to auto ISO so that I don't have to care about too many settings. I can just care about the aperture. I will usually set it to the sweet spot of my lens. If I'm using an f2.8 lens then I will set it to f4. If I'm using f5.6 lens then I will keep it at f5.6. Or if I want a little bit more background blur, I can crank up the aperture and get a little bit of more background blur. Also, if I'm asking somebody to take a picture of me with my camera, then I will also set it to aperture priority as well because I just don't want to deal with the settings and I will let the person take the picture with as many auto settings as possible. Regarding focus, I will always use auto focus in my camera if I can, unless I'm using manual focus lens like my Laowa 7.5mm manual lens. If I'm using autofocus, then usually I will set it to center single autofocus right in the middle. But sometimes I can also set the camera to focus into the whole entire sensor area if I want something spontaneous and I just don't want to think about the focus. Another important camera setting is to always shoot raw. I always shoot raw because if I mess up something when I shoot the picture, I can always edit it a little bit in post-processing. Whereas if you shoot JPEG, then everything is already set in stone. However, if you are sure that you can nail everything perfectly in terms of exposure and white balance, then by all means, don't be afraid to use JPEG. Not only you will get smaller file sizes, you can also have a more efficient workflow because you don't have to edit in post-processing. Now that we've talked a little bit about basic travel photography shooting techniques, as well as a little bit of camera settings, now I just want to talk a little bit about gear. But first, let me say that ultimately, gear doesn't matter. You can just use your phone, your mirrorless camera, your pocket camera, whatever. What I said before will apply to every kind of gear that you already have. I just happen to use Microfortis camera and I really love this camera system uh, because of some reasons that I will explain after this. But uh, hopefully what I said about the camera gear can be applied to your consideration as well. Now, as some of you might already know, I really love Microfortis camera and I really think that Microfortis is the best camera system when it comes to travel. However, everybody's requirements are different and my requirements happen to be very aligned with the philosophy of Micro Fortress. This is my main camera system that I always use for travel. I have a couple of Micro Fortress camera bodies and a whole bunch of lenses that I usually use. And I'm going to explain a little bit why I love Micro Fortress when it comes to travel photography.
First reason why I think Micro Fortress is the best when it comes to travel photography is because of its maximum portability as a dedicated camera system. Look at this camera body right here. It's not really that big. It can easily fit into any kind of travel bag. And then look at the lenses. They're just so small. They're just so cute and they're very easy to travel around with and they produce great image quality as well. The camera body, although they are using micro forted sensor, which is a crop sensor, they still produce good enough image quality in my opinion, especially for travel photography. If you don't require large printing, then I really think Micro Fortress is more than good enough. And you can see the jump of image quality when you compare it to a smartphone camera. When it comes to performance, I really think that Micro Fortress is still more than good enough. Yes, they struggle a little bit when it comes to continuous autofocus, especially during video, but that's not really a big problem. And for travel photography, I almost always use single autofocus anyway. And the good news is with Micro Four Thirds, single autofocus is near instantaneous. It's just so fast, so perfect. Micro Four Thirds is also slightly more affordable when compared to other camera formats. Their lenses, especially the older classic lenses, they still perform great and they are not that expensive. They are really, really affordable in my opinion and you don't have to invest a lot when it comes to lenses. And when it comes to camera bodies, you can always choose the older ones. They still perform great today and they are not as expensive as the newest and the greatest like the Panasonic GH6 or the new OM1 or whatever. Speaking about lenses, Micro Four Thirds has one of the most complete lens collection when it comes to mirrorless camera compared to full frame, compared to APS-C. They have lots of selection of different kinds of lenses, of different kinds of focal lengths, aperture, price range, size, and manufacturers as well. So they have a really complete selection. You can choose anything. I made some video about lenses in my channel. You can check one of them in the card above. But basically, when it comes to travel photography, I really think that you will benefit the most when you are using flexible zoom lenses. My choice currently for travel right now is this 8 to 18 millimeter by Panasonic Leica. This has a large aperture of f2.8, uh, but when you zoom into 18 millimeter, it goes to f4. Not a big deal, still large aperture and you can uh, get a little bit of that low light performance and this is an ultra wide angle lens. Perfect for travel. The other lens that I recommend the most is the Panasonic 14 to 140 mm f3.5 to f5.6, or its Olympus counterpart, or the Olympus 12 to 100 mm f4. They are all great super zoom lenses. With these two lenses, you can cover pretty much anything that you need to cover when it comes to travel. You can also go down to the route of using prime lenses. I usually prefer to use zoom lens when it comes to travel, but sometimes using prime lens can give you a little bit of freedom because you know that there are certain things that you cannot capture with just a single focal length uh, compared to a zoom lens that can have multiple focal lengths. So that less of flexibility gives you that peace of mind knowing that no, I don't need to capture everything and that can sometimes give you freedom. So yeah, just choose whatever works for you. Now that we've talked about the camera system itself, now I just want to briefly mention about accessories that you need for travel photography. First accessories, and it's a must in my opinion, a lightweight travel tripod. It's a must if you're doing long exposure, if you're taking a picture of yourself with your family and you don't need the help of other people, then you can use a tripod. It's just so useful when it comes to travel. Next accessories is a sturdy and good quality camera bag. It's a must in my opinion because this not only will carry your travel camera accessories, but also it will protect them from the elements. At least my bag can handle a little bit of rain, a little bit of snow, a little bit of unpleasant weather, and they will uh, be safe inside my bag, my camera equipment, I mean. And also, don't forget to bring a lot of SD cards because you never know when you're going to run out of memory. And then also, uh, my newest addition when it comes to uh, carrying camera besides straps and camera bag is this 
camera mounting uh, for your camera bag so you can attach this to you your shoulder strap and then you can attach the camera outside like so so that you can grab your camera quickly and easily and capture the moment without having to fumble around inside your bag trying to grab your camera and then also if you have spare room inside your travel suitcase or your uh, bag then you can bring a uh, backup device such as external hard drive or something like that and try to back up your footage, your photographs into the uh, SSD or into the hard drive every night or something like that just to make sure that you're not losing anything uh, if you're uh, damaging your SD card or something like that. And that wraps up today's video. So that is all for today's video. I hope that you find this video to be useful, informative, and enjoyable. Please comment down below if you have any question about travel photography. Also share your experience traveling using uh, micro photos or any camera formats that you have. I'd like to have a little bit of discussion down in the comments down below. Also make sure to subscribe to my channel because I will release my full course about travel photography in the future. I'm really excited about that and I hope that I can share it in my channel to all of you. Also don't forget to support my small channel by liking this video, sharing this video and once again subscribing to my channel. It will really help me to motivate me to keep making these videos for you. Thank you and goodbye.